okay, you guys can read this. So it makes sense. But it, it's going to tap into what we are going to talk about today. <coughs> Why is that the right answer? Because of the day. Well, yes, that's correct. Go ahead. Because the East Indian Company kind of controlled India before that, and the revolt was uh, mismanagement on their part being really bloody, so the English had to try to take control. It's a very good guess, not the right answer, but very good guess. So here, we're talking about mercantilism. Okay? And if you remember, mer mer the mother country. Okay, so mercantilism, the mother country, mom, right? So the mom, <coughs> mom and the little children. Now, if you remember, the very first approach to colonization was not based off of mercantilism. It really was based off of this exploration and thinking of, it's more, much more of a feudal system. The Spanish, for example, when the Spanish were out to try to get lands, they were doing so because land meant wealth. In Europe, if you got land, then you could have uh, build your castle and people would come to you. You'd have peasants coming to you because you would be protecting them. It's not a money exchange. If you got the land, that means that you were um, a vassal of somebody else who had a whole bunch of land. You could give out sections of land to people. They would build their castle. The peasants would basically work the land for them. They'd spend all their time being a knight and polishing their swords and really being able to fight. And if you remember, Columbus is 1492. It, it kind of calls me sometimes when we hold Columbus up to a standard for like 1900 or, or post enlightenment, 1492. This is Middle Ages. In the Middle Ages, land is wealth. And so that's how the Spanish looked at this. You go explore, you get this land. And what do we do? Well, we give it to the people who explored it. They become the lords of that little area. They create a castle. And naturally, all the peasants will come in and, and help work the land. Naturally, because that's exactly what they've been doing in Europe for the last thousand years. They had no other reference to it. Mercantilism changes this. Mercantilism is not land equals wealth. Um, profit and we look at this as almost like, well, it's obvious, but it, it's not. It's obvious today because we live in a commercial society, not just the United States, the world now is. And it is now because of the shift from this feudal into mercantilism, where basically you need to make sure that more gold comes in then goes out. This is not looking right, but how about that? Okay. <laughs> More gold in than goes out. In, in the plain language, that means if you're a business owner, you start up a bakery, you should be getting more sales money coming in than you're spending on the ingredients. That's a profit. But not just for individuals like me as a baker, this is a national policy. Now, you guys know, I don't want to get too deep here, but this is not news for you. This can only be a policy if we have modern nation states. Because then we're actually thinking about states and offices and treasuries. During the feudalism, you don't have modern nation states. We don't care about treasuries. We're not having to pay for a standing army. Does this make sense? We talked about this when we were going into the constitutionalism. One of the reasons why the English erupted in their civil war was that James I says, I'm an absolute monarch. I want your taxes. Give me the money because then I'm going to go off on this war and do great things for England. Well, he was fairly successful at it. Brother Charles comes in, asks for the same things. The nobles are saying, we keep giving you this money. You are failing. And so he says, well, we'll bring you all together, this big parliament, we bring you all together, give me the money. The parliament says, I'll give you the money if you respect these rights, petition of rights. And Charles said, sure, I'll respect the rights. He gets the money. As soon as he gets the money, he dissolves the parliament, says, I'm not listening to you anymore. This triggers the English Civil War. He loses his head over this. Cromwell has a revolutionary government for, I don't know, 10, 12 years. 
And when Charles II comes back in, he comes and they're promising to respect rights. This lasts for a little while, he dies, James II comes back and he goes back saying, no, nope, absolute monarch, I don't need to listen to you, you have to listen to me because I am kind of ordained to be your leader here. And uh, it didn't go well. This is when John Locke writes his second treatise on the second government. There's all sorts of enlightenment thinkers on this. John Locke is the most important one. He's the one that says, we hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are created equal, and they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. This concept of constitutionalism is based on the idea that a state has responsibility to the people that are in it. You cannot have this sense of rights without first having this sense of a state. And once you have this sense of rights, this is triggered by the fact that we have treasuries, people being asked to give money. It's a shift already in mercantilism. What happens is that instead of just thinking about taxes, we all start of thinking about larger policies. Mercantilism begins late 1600s. The Dutch really are the first to do this, the French do this, English kind of uh, dabble with it. By 1700, English is really good at this mercantile policy. Well, why, why would England be good at this? Why would the Dutch be good at this? More so than France. France dabbled, didn't do so well. I'll just give you a picture here. Here's France. Here's England. Why is England just naturally suited for this mercantile policy? I mean, I mean, even with France, right? They're, they're in ships all the time. France doesn't have to. France dabbles with it because they, they're beginning to really dabble in this modern nation state. Louis the Thirteenth is is trying to imitate James the First and being this this absolute monarch. Louis the Fourteenth, which you guys have all heard, the Sun King. He he's he's re resuming this absolute standard for leadership. He's doing this in the 1700s, early 1700s. James I was 100 years earlier. England went through this constitutionalism, and what you could say is that they kind of vented the pressure. France is late, so what's going to happen at the end of the 1700s? I don't know, 1789 or so? They didn't vent with constitutionalism. In other words, there's a great deal of pressure. The people are being asked to do taxes. They're, they're being unable to give um, any voice to this modern nation state, and yet they feel like their <coughs> rights are being violated, and nothing is being addressed. And so what's the natural reaction? They, they, they have a, a revolution. Now, they don't just have one revolution. They have two, I talked about. The nobles are the first. The peasants are the first to overthrow the king. Later, when the kids get involved, I mean the students, that's when you're going to have the second revolution. Just saw Les Miserables last night. That's kind of plot line. We'll put that aside. Okay. Mercantilism, once it's mature, and it is absolutely mature by the 1750s, okay? By 1800, even more so. The mother country needs to bring in cheap goods. And so we have not colonies for the sake of just having land. We don't claim all of South America. It's not useful. <coughs> we want trade. So if you're really developing our ports, that's a sophisticated mercantile policy. The Dutch have been doing this from the beginning, partially because the Dutch really are not a major military powerhouse. They don't have a very strong nation state. They're fine, kind of uh, fragmented, but they're really good with business. They've got banks, they've got money, they're big on business, and so they also start ports. You can have some islands that have two different ports, two different countries. But the goal of mercantilism is that you buy the raw materials. You're trading. It's a trade system. You bring them back home, the mommy 
finishes it up, and then you sell it. You sell it to everybody else, but you also sell it back to the colony. And this is a finished product. When you do that, you get a profit. Make sense? So then we go over to this question. East India Company is a company that's establishing English ports all over the world. There's lots of companies. East India is referring to which India? East India. West India is referring to which India? The West Indies, the Caribbean, right? Okay, so this, I, I talked about this a little bit. Indian. It doesn't refer yet to the country that we think of as India. Because India as a country doesn't exist. We'll talk about this tomorrow, but India is basically hundreds, hundreds, hundreds of these local, you might call them warlords, right? It's not feudalism, but there is no united India. There's no united India, so there's no India. So we call them the Indies, right? And if the Indies, off in India, the Indies is no like country we're referring to. So East Indies, East India Company, West Indies, Caribbean. This is a company. They set up a port. They set up ports in India. They set up ports in Africa. They set up ports in, not so much in Africa, because Portugal kind of owns that, but they do have some. They set up ports in Malaysia and China. Th these are just ports. And the goal is simply to trade. Now, okay, spice trade is certainly contributing to the creation of these companies. But it's, it's, it's just a demand. It's not a cost. <coughs> Ram and Mohan Roll we'll talk about in a second. The Indian Revolt is important because what does that do to the port? It threatens them. Does that make sense? All you want is a port. And if you're, if you're successful, all you need is a port. The United States is a funny example that talked England, and a lot of people, a lot. The American colonies. The American colonies were formed back when England was still thinking of land as some type of wealth. Uh, this is 1606. I mean, it's early. And, and England is not a strong country at this point. I mean, it's not weak, but it's, it is by no means like the strongest country. France has fur traders up to the north. That's where they're trading there in Canada. Spain has like a total monopoly on Central and South America. There's no way that the English can really get into that. So what's left? This scrub brush in the middle. And truly, from the English perspective, the Americans, the least valuable. Why is it the least valuable? There's nobody there, right? Remember, in feudal system, land is wealth. It's not wealth because it's land, it's because it's people. If you have land, you got people to work for you. That's where your wealth is. There's nobody in North America. So it's the least valuable. Spain at least had well, you know, the capital of the, the, uh, the Aztec uh, Empire. There's people there. They didn't all die. A lot of people died. But there's people there. In, in this old feudal system, people is where the wealth is. England looking at the United States, not called the United States, but these American colonies, is all that's left. But if we shift it, and we don't think of it simply as accessing the land, if we think of it as ports, then some of the American colonies become much, much more valuable. Now the problem is, is that the American colonies were exporting lots of people. I mean, we're talking millions of people over the course of about a uh, hundred years. And so when the England began to treat the colonies differently, not like they did here, but starting to treat them like mercantile, all we want you guys to do is give us the raw materials and then buy from us. And don't you dare sell your stuff to France or to Spain or anybody else. You have to sell it back to us. And we're going to tax you in the process. Oh, the, key the Americans got to be very upset and we had a revolution and they lost it completely. And from that England learned. And the first learning, what was the first lesson? 
try to think in my, uh, read my mind, but give me a guess of what the first lesson they would get from the American Revolution. So, the presentation of the colony. Yes, yes, but you only need representation of the colonies if you have English there. What would be a way of kind of evading that? I mean, they treat this with Canada. That's the first thing they do with Canada, is they give Canada, because there's already people there. Establish laws. Yeah, what do you think of Jason? All, all you need is just a port there. <laughs> you don't do this anymore. Focus on the port. In a perfect world, you won't have anything more than the port. And then they won't be upset about it. They're trading. You're giving them goodies, right? You're giving them finished products that they don't have. And they're giving you raw materials cheap. That's all you need. You don't have to have the land. You don't have to export people there. You don't have to try to encourage settlers out there. Because that's an old way of looking at your empire. You just need the ports. But that that's, it doesn't avoid the problem. It, it just kind of pushes it one step further. And what we're going to see, and we're going to talk about this when we talk about India, but basically India was mainly ports. That's all it was. But English influence begins to expand because these ports become very valuable, especially after 1800 when we no longer have the Americas. Where are the English going to get their cotton from? Getting it from India, right? So they want cotton to be uh, India to be making lots of cotton, some tobacco, all sorts of these products that we used to be getting from the Americas. So we need their raw materials. We bring them back to England and we turn them into things. But we, we, we use them as raw materials. Well, if they become so valuable, and if the chaos that really is the politics of India increases, then you begin to threaten the ports. And so the solution is to restore order. And by restoring order, your ports are protected. And how do you restore order? You have government control. It's not your first preference. We don't want to do that, but sometimes we have to do that. Does this make sense? Let me give you an example. We did what we're going to talk about on Monday, but let's go back and talk about the Middle East. Before we go too far, I just want to make sure you understood what our last discussion was all about. We have Islam that really dominates the Middle East from 650, way back. The problem is that we say the religion dominates, but when we talk about Islam, do we talk about a single entity? No. Lots of different groups. And from the beginning, what you have really are the Shia and the Sunni. Do you remember which of these? And these are the biggest differences. So the Sunni would be the sun and the tradition and practice. Tradition says son follows the father. Right? Um, but practice, the guy who's the best Muslim, means that the best lieutenant should follow. Does that make sense? Muhammad dies, who does it go to? Does it go to the son? Does it go to his best lieutenant? Well, the best Muslim ought to be able to have a voice, or you follow a tradition. And so right off the bat, we have two groups, and don't get me wrong, these guys fight each other. There's a concept that you guys know about, right? Jihad. I didn't talk too much about the theology of Islam. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about it here. I don't know if you know this, but we have... Uh, Judaism, monotheism, obviously, and then we have Christianity. We talked about this already. Christianity is different from Judaism because Judaism is looking for the Messiah, and what does Christianity believe? We found it. That Christ is the Messiah. That's it, right? Super easy. Well, this, you know, 2000 BC, and then here, literally, that's the, the beginning of our dating system. Off in Saudi Arabia, when Muhammad appears, Muhammad is about 600 years later. So, I like to just say 650 because that's when it's done. 
Is he influenced by Judaism and Christianity? Mm -hmm. Of course he is. He's also influenced by paganism. This is what the people at the time know. And so the Koran is called the recitations. The Koran. This is what the angel Gabriel was supposed to be telling Muhammad. Now you guys don't know this, but Muhammad's not sitting there with a pen and paper writing it down. The angel Gabriel speaks to him over a course of like 30 years. He never writes anything down. His followers remember. He has them, he says, this is what they said. They remember word for word. The, the, the uh, Arab kind of tribal culture is very, very oral based. Oral traditions. It's not written based. So they end up writing it down. As he's dying, right, later, that's the Quran, the recitations. This is what he said. Does that make sense? Basic uh, argument, there's five pillars. I'm not going to go into too much of the detail. The basic argument, though, is submission to God. This is important in terms of a historical perspective, because if everybody submits to God, then whose law always trumps? God's law or man's law? God's law. God's law. Always. Total submission to God. This is, and I know you've heard this term today, this is what that basis, the concept of Sharia law is. What does that really mean, Sharia law? It's the law of the religion, religious law. You have religious police. You get off the, the plane in Iran, and there's a religious police officer right there. If you're a girl, you immediately put on the outfit. You go to jail, you get abused, you whatever, if you don't have it. It's not a matter of faith. In the West, we have separation of church and state from the beginning. It's, it's kind of part of Christian theology. Our treasure is not of this world. It's, then, it's part of Christian theology. Go ahead. Didn't Constantine kind of mess that up and try to... No, it? not at all. No, well, Co what Constantine did... No, that's a very good question. Very good question. No, what he did... What Constantine did was made Christianity legal. And immediately he called in all the bishops to Nicaea to have a council. Oh, yeah. And he, he talked to the Pope. He said, I am the leader of this world, of the, the political world. You are the leader of the church, and we are separate. This is Constantine saying this. It's a very, very old tradition. And it's a theological basis because our kingdom is not of this world. Christianity is very clear. We're not of this world. Separation of church and state. Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Render unto God what is God's. In Islam, there is no separation of church and state. This is really important to understand. That's what the whole concept of Sharia law. You have a strong political state, then your religious leader is the natural political leader. That's kind of why you had this big debate right off the bat between the Sunni and the Shia. Because the Sunni said, well, the political leader ought to be the son. The son follows the father. <coughs> Muhammad's son ought to be the leader. That's tradition. And then the orthodoxy guy said, no, the guy who's most Muslim, his lieutenant, he's the one that ought to be the next leader. Instant, boom, conflict. Now, we look at this in hindsight and we say, well, this really isn't much more kind of than a tribal conflict, right? And that's exactly what was in Saudi Arabia before Muhammad. This does not go away. But one of the ways that Muhammad was able to grab all the different tribes is God's law above all other laws. Total submission to God. That means that there is no separation of church and state. This is really important. No separation of church and state. That's what this concept of jihad means. In, in, the United, in, in, in um, Christianity, Jesus dies, he saves you. He dies so that you don't have to. Very strong sense of salvation. Even in Judaism, this Messiah is the pathway to salvation. Salvation is critical to Judeo-Christianity. In Islam, there is no salvation. You follow God's rules. Total submission. If you follow God, if you follow God, then you are alive. 
that make sense? What if you don't follow God? Then you didn't have a soul. Something. You're dead. Now, Islam also, modern Islam is different. We'll talk about this as the difference between Shia and Sunni. Modern Islam is different, but there's no free will in Islam. No free will. <coughs> it, it's part of the total submission. There's no free will. God has absolutely total control. You have no free will. So pause for a second and connect the dots. Total submission. You have no free will. If you are following God, you are alive. If you are outside, you are dead. What does it mean if you are outside? We just what's the term that we use? If you are an infidel, if you're outside, you're not following God, and you're dead. But you are still walking and talking. What does it mean? Spiritually dead. There's no salvation. Go ahead, Jason. It's that there's no that there's no chance for you. There's no salvation. There's no chance for you. So you are basically dead man walking. Oh, wow. So if you kill the dead man walking, have you killed anybody? You don't have to. You understand that? Jihad then is a holy war. Now, long time since 650s to the present day. And yet, total submission, no free will. The Shi'i folks would say nothing has changed. Because it's all about practice. The Sunni folks would say, well, you know, sometimes things change. We don't quite believe in Shia, uh, I mean, in the jihad quite so much as, you know, they may have in the past. Which of these two groups is going to be more receptive to Western traditions? Sunni. Clearly. I mean, just screaming clearly, right? When I asked last class about Turkey, why was Turkey, I said, Turkey is most influenced. What physically you see that they're right there. <laughs> it makes sense. But what also, what's the other example about Turkey? What is their religious? They are mostly Sunni. They are tradition based, not, not the practicing. Same too, by the way, with over here in Spain. What about the people here in Saudi Arabia region? Sunni or Shia mostly? Yeah. That's the birthplace, absolutely, is Shia. What about over here in what would be modern day Iran and Iraq? Mostly mm -hmm. mostly Shia, but it's right in the middle of things. And this is a double problem, right? Because it's right in the middle of things, do we have unanimity? Do we have a strong political state? Absolutely no. fighting. In the midst of this, we also throw in a couple of groups. The Sufi. Who are the Sufi? Kind of like mystics. And they are all over the place. They're not bound by any particular region because they're also not dominant. They're just minorities. Think of them as the, uh, the guy who lives in the cave, right? Who is the hermit that lives off in the cave. That would be more of the Sufi, Sufi mysticism. We also, however, have Karajites. And Karajites, uh, today we don't call them Karajites, we call them Wahhabists. And this is, uh, starts off in the 1800s. What's a Wahhabist? Ultra-Orthodox. Not just Shia, but ultra-Orthodox. And so they are totally in favor of the whole Jihad thing. Very traditional. The thing is, is that very traditional really translates into very political. Because there's no separation of church and state. So when you're making a religious expansion, aren't you also making a political expansion? And if you are in a region that's very fragmented, who is going to be the guy who's most wanting to unite them? It's going to be more of the Wahhabis. Okay. Is this have a big impact on the Middle East? Yeah. Yeah. Just gigantic. Let me pause that for a second and we'll go over here. And I'm going to introduce something new. It's not really new. It is, um, I've talked about it, I just haven't been uh, explicit. So here's my option. I'm going to talk about this concept of Europeanization. 
and I love this word because it's a word that you already know. What's another word for Europeanization? Colonization. No. Colonization. What was it? Colonization. Mm, not quite. You know this from the first day of class. Wouldn't we call um, uh, China's influence on Japan like Chinification? <laughs> or Korea's influence on Japan, Koreanification? It, they're made up words. All they are, it's, it's, a, it's a phrase <coughs> to describe cultural diffusion in a particular instance. Makes perfect sense. As Europe is moving all over, and this is not just England, but England and France and the Dutch, right? and all these other countries, they're all mommy countries, and they have mercantile colonies all over. By the 1800s, everybody is on this bandwagon. And so then we have ports. There are two avenues of cultural diffusion. Do you remember the two ways in which we see cultural diffusion most? I'll give you the first one, war. What's the second one? Trade. Okay. So. Um, the whole goal of mercantilism, if you are successful, what do you avoid? Keeping in mind what we remember with the American Revolution. What do we avoid? What's one of the lessons of the American Revolution? What do we want to avoid? We, we don't want war. We don't want war. This isn't like I'm an empire. I want to kill people for the sake. It's the exact opposite. Because war is really bad for business. Mercantilism is a business model. And so you, you, you don't want war if you can help it. But the fact is, can you help it? Because one of the things we, we know is that the more that your cultural diffusion increases, what's going to happen to that cultural identity? It's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to change. It, do people like this change? No, sometimes they're, they're, they're willing to fight because they don't want to change. And so even though you don't want war, it's not uncommon that war comes up. But in the mercantile model, you're going to do your best to avoid it. But it's still trade. And the more you trade, you just accelerate the rate of cultural diffusion, which weirdly enough is going to accelerate the change of the cultural identity. So you, you're going to have wars, even if it's totally not intended. Let's take a second about Middle East. So we have this region. I'm going to make a, a totally non-scale map, but you'll get the point. So here's the Middle East. It's a crescent. There you go. Totally non -scale. So there's the Middle East. Here's Europe. OK. So clearly, and here is, by the way, India. India is actually a height. So which side of the Middle East is going to be most influenced by Europe, especially this side that used to be like Spain? Heavily influenced, right? Spain is going to be simply Europe. But it's always a little bit different. Even today, it's a little bit different, right? This interchange, heavily influential. What's going to be least European? least. It would be more Indian. But uh, that's a little bit funny. Because India has actually got a very, very, very long history. And so even though we're going to get Europe trading in India, does Europe totally transform India? No. You know this from China. Does Europe totally transform China? No. A very deep cultural identity. They may not have a strong political structure. They don't. But their cultural identity is like 2,000 years old. And so we've got influx. What area is going to be most removed <coughs> from this? And it, it's a bad question. So let me just give you a visual. You guys, ah, I can't give you a visual. How about this area? How about this big uh, desert? <laughs> Saudi Arabia. Why don't we have a lot of European influence in Saudi Arabia? Super easy answer. I gave it to you when I described it. So it's a big desert. Okay. Why does Europe go in there? 
no reason for Europe to go in there. It's, there's not a lot of magnet, there's not a lot of attraction. So there's not a lot of European influence. What's the big influence in Saudi Arabia and its regions, the desert regions? Well, you have a lot of tribal influence, even though they're all Muslim now. Have we solved those tribal differences? That difference between Sunni and Shiite, is it, is it totally religious-based? No. Of course not. It's very strong tribal legacies. And mainly because even though they come up with the states, it's, it's not a big strong state. It's certainly not a modern state. So we have tribal influences. We have Islam, which is naturally got a connection between the politics and the theocracy, the theology. And so when our cultural diffusion influences people, these guys almost naturally are going to be, they were already more Sunni. And the fact that they're more Sunni, the cultural diffusion is very high. And it means that this guy tends to be more Western. Turkey is going to be more Western. Are they going to be completely Western? No, they're still Muslim. And Islam is a big difference between Europe, Christian, Jewish, mostly Christian. And so they're still Muslim, but they're going to be more Western. These guys over here are going to actually be more Indian. But these guys... Very, very <coughs> orthodox. And when the trade starts affecting the cultural diffusion, does this make these people closer together or further apart? Further apart. Yes. And that's what the whole Wahhabis did. We are not going to let Europe come in here, affect okay. us. First of all, Europeanization, what, are, what do these two maps represent? This one we talked about, what is this one? English. That's the English Empire. Now, it used to have, you know, met, but they failed on that one. So here we have the Canada. These are all the English colonies. When they said the sun never sets on the English Empire, that's what they mean. No matter where you are in the globe, the sun is going to shine on some English colony. This is physically, it's huge. It's huge. No, the red. Oh, okay. Now, what about this? <clears throat> it's kind of the same thing, but it's not. It's it's actually showing that there's lots of different countries. Who's the most? There's lots of different kinds. Lots of different kinds. Who's most? England. England. Now, the funny thing here is that we've got Spain, right? Up before 1914. If we're looking at 1814. <coughs> What would the colors look like? You don't have exactly the dates here, but I'll just tell you 1814 would be before this date. What would the colors here be? Mostly the Spanish and the Portuguese. But beginning around 1821, when Mexico revolted, up until 1825, almost one after another, after another, after another. Within a four or five year period, they just revolted over and over again. What was Spain able to do about it? Nothing. And why? Because when they took the land, they weren't thinking in terms of mercantilism and ports. It was totally about land and people and putting governors there and people there. Well, they just revolted. And Spain was unable to control. By that time, Spanish power had fallen significantly. By 1914, they didn't have anything. A couple of spots right here. And they don't show this, but Cuba, clearly. Puerto Rico still. Most of the Caribbean. point, though, is Europeanization is this influence all over the world. Who is, in 1914, right before World War I, most influenced by Europe in terms of a region? We haven't really talked a lot about it at all. But the map gives you a hint. Who's got the most colors? Africa. Africa is really kind of a gateway. Okay? I'm going to go with this. France, you got Italy, you got uh, England, you got the Dutch. South Africa, even though they speak English, was never English. It's always Dutch. 
the Afrikaans, Dutch, right? That they come around to trading, they put a port right there. Well, they end up taking over and separating and dividing up Africa. I'm going to go into this maybe a little bit later. I'll talk about it in a second. But are they going in here to grab slaves? Not necessarily. Not, not at all. The exact opposite. In fact, most of the internal exploration for most of the 15th, 16th, 1700s, European contact is solely on the coast. That's why there's all these little countries along the coast. These are all ports. It was solely on the Nobody went inside. Remember, we talked about this. Europeans don't go running into the African jungles, grabbing people and putting them into ships. If they did that, they would be dead, right? So they trade with Africans who are doing that. Africans are trading with Africans. What's happening is that by the late 1800s, missionaries, England is the source of abolition in the world, religious. Missionaries here, the only place where slavery still exists is in Africa. So they're going into Africa, largely to try to end the slavery. You guys understand uh, that very old joke, and I don't think anybody actually understands this. Dr. Livingston, I presume. You've heard the phrase, Dr. Livingston. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Okay. It used to be much more common. Uh, so Livingston was a, a, a missionary is lost in the deepest, darkest Africa for 30 years. Some guy goes in and he's trying to find Livingston. He's actually trying to find other things. He's just exploring himself. He goes into this African uh, village. Everybody's black, of course, because it's Africa. And right in the middle of the village is this one guy, white guy. He just walks up to him, you know, three. Dr. Livingston, I presume, because they're British, right? British, they do things like Dr. Livingston, I presume? Uh, yeah, how'd you guess? <laughs> this really isn't as hard as it looks. <laughs> okay, the point is, that's, that's how the year gets inside. It's not about slavery. It's very much about mercantilism. Because what do you have inside? Well, they go in there for religious purposes, but what do you find in there? This is where resources are not the ivory and the gold that everybody wanted to have in the 1500s, 1600s. It's got fields. You've got uh, farms. You, you, you could grow coffee. You, you could grow cotton. You can grow uh, chocolate. You, you can actually kind of develop it. And since nobody has strong states here, if you develop it and present order, weirdly enough, the locals kind of flock to you. And they do. Of course, not, not always, because the whole concept of this cultural diffusion is that the more you're in there, the more they change. More they change. Some people are big on the change because they got more technology, more stuff. Some people, not so much. Particularly in Africa, who is not going to like this change? The people. The tribal leaders, right? This makes perfect sense. So lots of wars in here as well. Okay, let me go back. There is a process of colonization, and when I say process of colonization, you have to understand that this is not first. Colonization. This isn't a process that we use when we're Spain and we're just trying to grab big chunks of land. This is colonization under mercantilism. And so we're looking at, at best, 1750s, but really it doesn't come into fruition until the 1800s. We start exploration 1500s, but 1500 and 1600s is really exploring and trying to claim land in a much more feudal style. By 1750s, 1800s, we have shifted. And it's about ports. It's about trading. It's a business model. We want to have our raw materials. With this shift, we have a different process of colonization. And I might argue, unintentional. Because in a perfect world, you always have ports, and you only have ports. It's a perfect world. If you are uh, McDonald's, do you want to spend money putting a security guard in every one of your stores? Can you imagine how much money that is? Shockingly high. It's much better if you don't have to, if you just let the local police take care of security. Okay? But sometimes you have to. That's this one. So here's the process. Number one. 
global relationships. And I use this word deliberately. This is not, in your textbook, sometimes I don't, I don't know, I think because it's such a dialectical narrative, they don't, they don't emphasize the concept of a relationship. They usually think Europeans come in and say, hey, we're better than all you guys, plus we're racist, and we're men, we're sexist too, we're going to just take all of you guys as slaves. It's so unrealistic. Can someone just tell me, like, in plain language, why that's unrealistic? Okay, let's put it in real terms. I'm going in the middle of Africa. I'm Dr. Livingston. <laughs> I'm the only white guy here, and I come in and I say, Yep, uh, all you guys are now my slaves. <laughs> How, how's that going to go over? <laughs> You're dead. Okay. You, you are not the majority. The whole point is you are establishing a, a relationship because you are not the majority. You are a distinct minority. You might have a gun, but does that really help you if there's 800 of these guys? No. It doesn't. So it you genuinely established relationships. And this isn't new. What did the French do really early on? And they weren't doing this because they were being um, humanitarian. French were doing this really in the middle of Louis XIV, Louis XV. They didn't have any sense of constitutional due process in quite the same way. They went off to the Indians because that's how you got the furs. That's how you traded with them. You, you, didn't, you weren't out there to set up a government, you just simply get the furs. And that's what this, this mercantilism might do. You establish a relationship. As soon as you do this, two things happen. What do the Europeans have? Always. That they can give. That they have an advantage over the guy that they're visiting. Technology? Yes. Okay. I shouldn't have said it that way. I, um, I go to Maria. I want uh, Maria's backpack. I really like Maria's backpack. I want her backpack. Okay, in order for me to get her backpack, I could beat her over the head, give her a kick, and steal her backpack. But what's going to happen? What are you guys all going to do if I pick on poor Maria? I'm dead. You guys kill me. Okay. Exaggeration. With what? Okay. So, what's the other option? I say, hey, Maria, I really like your backpack. Establishing relationship. That's what I want, but I have to give. What do the Europeans have that the, the locals want? Well, technologies, right? But what kind of technologies? They have guns. They have basic technologies, right? So glass, always big. Why is glass always big? It's not a big, important technology, but it is. <laughs> it's a big deal. If you're off in your hunter-gatherer, or you're a nomad, or you're off a tribal, you no know glass. Glass is a big deal. Is it expensive for the Europeans? Super easy. Where are the raw materials for glass? Do you guys know this? Sand. Sand. Okay, it's everywhere. Not expensive. We give you some glass. Um, people are fighting you all the time. What also might we give you? Weapons. Weapons. Now, are we careful about this? Yes. Yeah. Yes. We're not going to give you the top line. Why don't we give you the top line weapons? This is super easy. So they can have them since they can overpower them. Yeah, I mean, I'm a minority as it is, right? I don't want you to be able to kill me, but I'll give you some minimal ones. Things that are not as advanced as mine, but they're more advanced than what your neighbors have. This is where, no matter where you are in the world, that almost always sells. And so we've got technology. And then what do we get in response? What do the natives want? I mean, excuse me, uh, what do the natives offer? And this is really important to understand because I think a lot of people get confused. And it has to do with that old exploration thing. Everyone's talking about gold, like they want gold. How much gold do the natives like, generally have? Not None, okay? The, the king might have some gold that's been inherited down generation. It's gone. It's gone. There's nothing more. It's not gold. We're not talking about intrinsic goods. This is the shift in mercantilism from 1750s to 1500s. Even the French didn't quite get this. They went out and they wanted furs. Furs are intrinsically valuable. Mercantilism doesn't have to have furs. Because if you're only going out with furs, what happens after a while? You kill all the people. You, you, the furs are gone. And then where's your value? Mercantilism is looking at really raw materials. Wood. 
Wood is not valuable if you're in India. Okay, no value at all because what is it? It's all around you. But you take the wood, you ship it back to England, you mill it, you turn it into lumber, and you turn it into beautiful cabinets. You bring those back, and you show that to the Indian. That they love, right? Because they don't see it that way. That's something different. The wood, not valuable. The whole concept is you get the raw material dirt cheap. Then you finish it. So two things that they offer. They're going to offer some type of raw material. But more importantly, they're going to offer the port. And what we look for is a concept, when I say we, which are in a, a European series, called extra territoriality. Does anybody know what this means? If you don't, I'll give you a hint. Extra territoriality. Go ahead. This is kind of where the port that they get is under their control. Yeah. It's it's think of it in an, an, an embassy. Embassies are all extraterritoriality. If they had a French embassy in Richmond Center, which they would, but if they did, that actually would be French property. The size and the scope of the building, but it's French property. Our uh, police would not be able to go in there because it's, it's not American, it's French property. One of the agreements we give when we do an embassy is that that's your property. Extraterritoriality. That's what the Europeans want, especially England. England is best at this. Just give me the port, and if you give me the port, whether it's inside or outside, it doesn't have to be a navy port, wherever it is, I want extraterritoriality there. That's our stuff, our police, our focus. And if you think about it from a trading perspective, it's our warehouse. Okay? I'm not paying some local to protect our goods. It's the British that are going to be there to protect. So we have local relationship, and then we have this exchange. Well, you guys all understand this concept of cultural diffusion. What inevitably happens? Is cultural, first of all, is cultural diffusion avoidable? No. Absolutely not. It's totally inevitable. Even if you don't want it, it's going to happen. So what you have is reactions. So trade produces cultural diffusion, which is going to affect your cultural identity, which is going to have reactions and expansion. The reaction number one. So you are dealing with tribe number A. And because you're dealing with him, he's becoming very powerful. What about tribe number A's friends on the borders? They are now less powerful. Do they like tribal A now? They like them all less. And they're afraid of them. So what does tribal B, C, D, and E want to do? As best as possible, they're going to steal some of the weapons that you gave to Tribal A, and then they're going to have big wives. Well, what is Tribal A now going to be asking you for? More weapons, more powerful weapons. And there's always a deal here. And what's happening is that you're here, you're on the port. This is my port, and all I want is this port. And this is the guy that I have a relationship with. But these are all the people outside, and, and they're being influenced by your influence of them. So they're getting some of those weapons. And because they have some of those weapons, maybe they're fighting more than they did before. And so how do you, how do you stop that? Another term here, pacification. It's a wonderful word, and if you look at it, you can kind of, you can figure it out even if you've never heard it before, pacification. What is a pacifist? Oh. These guys like peace, right? Just peace, pacifist. Pacification. Peacification. But you guys also are smart enough to realize that <laughs> if you want peace, what, what do you usually have to use? In war, okay? And so pacification means these guys are all fighting? Well, okay, I'm sorry guys, but you guys are not able to control this. We are now expanding our extraterritoriality to include you. And we'll deal directly with these people, and we'll put them in some order, right? That'll be fine for a little bit, because you're right there. Except, you know, um, there's other people that are on their order. And slowly, your pacification means that over time, in order for you to maintain the peace, 
you have to expand your footprint. Do you want to expand the footprint? No. But once you do, what happens to trade? What happens to the order, the police? The, your ability to, to move your car, our cargo from this for, uh, side of the port to that side. So much more order. It's peaceful. So you don't want to, but when you do, there is an advantage. You don't want to. You'd rather they take care of it themselves. That's the reactions. You've got <coughs> expansions. Eventually, if you take this to its extreme, what does that mean? It means that you've got everything. We're going to see this in India. And we started off, what was the event that triggered greater English influence in India? The revolt. Because it was just, it was chaos, and there was no order. And so England just took it over. They ended company control, and they put in crown rule. Then the company can operate with peace. Does that make sense? India is different, though. When we look at the Middle East, it doesn't fit that way. Why doesn't it fit in part the same way? We'll talk about this later, but what's one thing that India has going for it? Yeah, yeah. We'll go back to China. Around the second century BC, what came into China? It didn't revolutionize China then, but by 1100 AD, 1300 years, it absolutely changed their culture. But it comes in around the second century. What is this? What am I talking about? Buddhism. That's right. Well, where did it come from? India. India's got a very long history, very rich cultural identity. It's not politically unified. We're going to talk about this. It's not a swinging back and forth, but it has periods where it's kind of united, and it just has periods where it's not. You're going to see uh, Hindus are dominant, but you're also going to see Muslims in big parts, right? The Taj Mahal, the guy's Muslim. That's later. But you, you have Muslim folks, you have Hindu folks. You, you don't really have a lot of Buddhist folks left because it doesn't fit into the caste system. But their social system is shockingly stable. And part of it has to do with the castes. It's not a political stability where you have one country, but social stability very strong. What don't you have in Middle East? Social stability. Really? What's the length of their cultural identity? <coughs> How long? How old is that? We go back to India. It's, it's about 1200 BC, right? Where is the Middle East? When do they get their first really cultural identity? About 650, right? It's not that old. And right off the bat, as soon as Muhammad dies, what do they go into? Divisions. Not just divisions political, but really the political divisions are reflecting these also religious divisions. The Shia and the Sunni. They never, today they're not united. So that makes for a different field of operation. Some are more receptive to westernization, others are not. I've got three minutes here. Let me see if I can give you some examples. Egypt, the Ottomans. Egypt, long history. But the people living in Egypt in 1800, are there any connection whatsoever to the people that built the pyramids? Probably not. Zero. Long time ago, zero. The Romans took over, then after the Romans took over, the, um, uh, the, the Christians had dominance there for a very long time. And then when Muhammad came over, they swept over, literally, physically swept over. And, and they're just not the same people. Literally not the same people. Okay, But Egypt does have an importance. Why did Egypt start 3500 BC? What did Egypt have that this region really relies on? Water, the Nile. Okay. What also does this region have that mercantilism really, really is interested in? Do they have cotton? No. Certain. What do they have? Oh, canal. The Suez Canal. And why is that a big deal? 
cuts off a shocking amount of time. You don't have to go around Africa. This becomes a hot spot. So people come in there very early. France goes in there. Napoleon goes to Egypt before he takes over the rest of Europe. It's because of the it's, it's a region. No other reason. There's nothing else here. Now what about the Ottoman Empire? They've been there since 1453. They've been pushing into Europe forever. When the Western Empire, the Byzantine Empire died, they took over. They, they're westernized, but they're not. They've got urban cities. They're not deserts. So they're naturally westernized with certain western technology, but they're still a little bit behind. And then all these spots in between. So here we have Jamal al-Din Afghani. He is famous for coming up with these ideas that try to merge Islam with the West. These guys are the ones that are responsible for getting rid of the concept of jihad and dead man walking. And this idea that the state has to absolutely be a religious. But look at the dates of these people. This is 20th century. Why do these people even come about? What has happened for these people to come up with their ideas? Europe, total industrialization, spreading in, not necessarily destroying or fighting with the Ottomans, although there are lots of wars here, Crimea War being a perfect example, but also trade. These guys are becoming westernized, and so the Islamic thinkers are kind of westernizing their theology. This is where you see the most kind of modern western sides of Islam. Well, who's not here? These guys aren't here. Do they have the same westernization? Yeah. No. Last little bit. I think I just did that. Oh, that was it. Okay. We, we keep pointing to 1914, right before World War I. And I'll just give you the hint. World War I is a war of empires. So what's happening in the 1800s to bring World War I about? Building the empires, not just the British. France is going to go into Africa. Lots of French, that's where most of their empires are. Germany is going to have some things in Africa, but they don't become a state until 1871, so a little late. Italy doesn't become a state until 1860, but they also have uh, uh, handholds in Africa. England is the really the only one that's really strong across the country. The Dutch have places over there, Spanish had, but they're losing them. You're building empires. In World War I, do you remember the famous Spanish army in World War I? No, because they're not an empire. <coughs> what were you going to say? Okay. What do we want you to think about? Next class, <coughs> today's Wednesday, right? Monday, India. And what we're going to do is we're going to apply the exact same process. In, uh, Middle East is, is unique because it's so fragmented. India is not politically united, but their social system, the caste, is much more consistent. So we're going to see this in very specific terms in India. Questions? And I want you guys to read about India. Questions, comments, words of wisdom? Oh, we'll see you guys on Monday. Day of the moment.